Hello, uh, and welcome to your first day at First Local Cat Savings Bank. We're so excited that you're all joining us in our new office here in Tokyo to bring the next generation of saving accounts to our customers. This is a brief 20-minute induction session to go through step-by-step -step what you'll be building and working on here at First Local Cat Savings Bank. Let's start by taking a look at our original savings account. A user puts their deposit on the platter, the cat comes up to take the coin, and the money is deposited into their savings account. Now this has worked really well for our customers, but they want something smarter now. So introducing our savings account version two, we've taken the original account and added user authentication so that only authorized users can make a deposit. So here are the users putting in their PIN number. And now when we try to make a deposit, <laughs> the cat comes and gets it. Deposit into progress and then it updates on the app and says what our new balance is. So <laughs> let's look at how we can build this step by step. The first step is really step zero, which is to set up our development environment. So we're going to be using a Raspberry Pi uh, because it supports Swift. It has something called GPIO pins, uh, which allow us to communicate directly with components and sensors. And it has Bluetooth LE, which means we can mu communicate easily with iOS devices. The other thing that will make your job much easier is a multimeter. A multimeter is basically a debugger, but for hardware. Uh, it allows you to test different parts of the circuit and to know if something's gone wrong because something probably will go wrong at some point. There's no need to worry if you haven't done anything with electronics before. Uh, you don't need to be able to solder or solder, depending on how you pronounce it. Uh, and we'll be using solderless breadboards and jumper wires to hook up sensors to our Raspberry Pi. So first, we want to install Swift on the Raspberry Pi, and we can use a pre-compiled binary of Swift. Uh, this will give us the Swift language, the compiler, and the package manager, but the REPL isn't supported yet. Uh, so now we can create a new project. We type in Swift package init minus minus type executable, and we'll have a project ready to use. Unfortunately, Xcode isn't supported on Linux yet, <laughs> But WWC isn't that far away, so fingers crossed. But for now, we'll be using something called Genie, uh, which is an IDE that ships with uh, Raspbian, which is one of the most popular versions of Linux for Raspberry Pi. Genie won't know exactly what to do with our Swift code, uh, but we can modify the build commands, uh, and then Genie will be able to handle compilation and execution of our Swift application. <coughs> So now that we have our new project, let's roll those sleeves up and start hacking some hardware. So to make sure that only authorized users can make a deposit, the first thing we want to do is to be able to control the power going to and from the coin bank. In the first version of our savings account, power is supplied by two batteries and there's no user authentication. In version two, we want to be able to power the coin bank from the Raspberry Pi and require user authentication before a user can make a deposit. To get there, we need to hook up the power leads from the coin bank to the Raspberry Pi. Then we need to be able to tell the Raspberry Pi when to and when not to supply power. But before we jump into this, let's take a step back and understand a little bit about circuits. So circuits are basically a loop where current flows through. Something like a switch gives us the ability to open or close the loop. When the switch is closed, it allows the current to flow through whatever is connected. But when the switch opens, it breaks the flow, and whatever is connected doesn't receive current. So this is basically what we want to do to be able to cause a break in the loop so that power isn't being supplied to the savings account. To build the circuit, we're going to use something called breadboards. These are a bit like playgrounds. They give you a way to prototype and try things out before committing to something more permanent. They come in many sizes and colors, but all work 
basically the same way. Current can travel across uh, the rows indicated with the green lines and the columns also indicated with the green lines. So to be able to communicate with these components that we hooked up in a circuit to our Raspberry Pi, we're going to use the GPIO pins on the Raspberry Pi. GPIO stands for General Purpose Input Output. Uh, this is a diagram showing uh, basically the pins on the Raspberry Pi uh, 3B+, which is the one that we're using in our smart bank account. Uh, there's a total of 40 pins here. Uh, some of them are labeled with 3.3 volts or 5 volts. These supply power. Uh, there's also ground connections, and then we've got a bunch the leftover ones are basically the GPIO, like 2, 4, 18. Uh, and these are the ones that we'll primarily be working with. Uh, we can set them as input or output. To be able to communicate with these pins through Swift code, we're going to use a library called Swifty GPIO. So we'll add this dependency in, and now we're ready to start actually communicating with these pins in Swift. First, we need to be able to supply power to the coin bank. So we're going to actually take the bottom of the coin bank off. We're going to disconnect the wires. Uh, we can do this just by actually using scissors. Uh, and then we want to make the cables a little longer. So we can just remove a little bit of the insulation from the wires, twist them together, cover some electrical tape. Nothing will go wrong, I promise. <laughs> uh, and then basically, we've extended the wires. Uh, to turn the power off and on, uh, we can use a component called a relay. A relay is basically a switch so that we can tell it when to be on uh, and when to be off. So this is how we're going to wire up our relay into our circuit with a Raspberry Pi. And with all of it wired up, let's take a look at our Swift code. Uh, so this is where we will use the Swifty GPIO code to communicate with the pins. If we take a look at setup, uh, we can set the relay. We set the relay up uh, with pin 4, uh, and then set it as an output because we want to send information out to the pin. And then finally, when we want to turn the relay on or off, we can use our switch to function. So when I say on and off, what does that actually mean? With the Raspberry Pi, we deal only with digital signal. If we think of signal as continuous, at any given time, there's like a single value that the signal can be. With digital signal, the value can only ever be 0 or 1. So when we send on, or well, 1 through a GPIO pin, we're saying send 3.3 volts. And we send 0 or off through a GPIO pin, we're telling it to send no voltage to that pin. So now that we know how to switch power on and off when needed. Let's see how we can handle when a deposit is being made. So how can we tell when a deposit is being made? Well, when the user places their coin on the platter, the lid opens. And so we can probably figure out when it's open by measuring how much light is inside the coin bank. So we'll do this by using a photoresistor. Now, when light falls on the surface of the disk, the resistance will decrease. And we can use this change to know how bright the inside of the bank is. But this change in resistance is provided as an analog signal, which isn't helpful for us because our pins understand digital signals. So we'll need a way of getting from one type to another. So if we look at an analog signal, analog signals can be any number. We could have a zero or a one, but we could also have 128 or 900. To be able to get a digital signal, we'll use an MCP3008, which is an analog to digital converter. With our analog to digital converter hooked up in our main circuit, we can add in the photoresistor. So this is how we wire everything up into our circuit. Uh, and our MCP3008 has eight different channels for working with different analog sources. Uh, so we'll wire the analog output of the photoresistor into channel one of the MCP3008. 
Now, because it is slightly different the way it provides data, we also need to add another dependency into our project. So there's a library for working specifically with the MCP 3008. So we'll add this in. And then we've got some code for basically working with the photoresistor. And we'll run it a few times to, with it inside the power bank, uh, the coin bank, to get some baseline readings of when the lid is open and when it's closed. OK, so we know when the lid is open, when it's closed. We need to figure out what the value of the coin that's being deposited is. So we'll do this by calculating the difference in weight between the previous deposit and the current deposit. And this difference will give us the weight of the coin. So to be able to weigh objects, we're going to use a load cell. Uh, inside a load cell is basically a bunch of thin wires. And when you put something on top of a load cell, on the picture on the right, <laughs> Uh, it causes it to bend, and that causes the wires to bend and causes a change in resistance. So this change in resistance then gets fed into an analog to digital converter called an HX711. So this is an analog to digital converter that is designed specifically to work with load cells. So we can't use the MCP3008 here. To understand more about how this actually works, we're going to look at the data sheet. So data sheets are a crucial part in building uh, and working with circuits and electronics. They're like an instruction manual for the components. They explain what a component does and how to use it. They list things like features, specifications, block diagrams, pin descriptions, assembly code for the driver, and also some sample code in C that explains how we can actually get usable values from the HX711. So in essence, we need to do something called bit banging, which is what this code does. Um, this is basically where we'll be using software to directly set and sample the state of pins in order to get a usable signal. Now, when we looked at digital signal before, when we wanted to turn the relay switch on, we sent it a one, and this meant that the pin would send 3.3 volts through itself. Now, reading in a digital signal is the same. It can only be a one or a zero. But analog signals can be any number, not just ones and zeros. So we could have 51, or negative 48, or 3,826. So how do we get this, this analog number into a digital number if all we have to work with is ones and zeros? Well, we could take the binary representation of these numbers. Then we have a, the numbers in a form where it's made up entirely of ones and zeros. Cool. Now we have the values binary number comprised of numbers we can use. But we can only send one, like A1 or A0 at a time. We can't send everything at once. But if we agree on a word length, basically if both like the sensor, or the analog to digital converter, and the software know that the value is supposed to be supplied in a 12-bit word length, uh, then we can know when we've received an entire value. So now. With word length agreed, we can send each number <laughs> bit by bit. We're not going to do the whole number. That would take too long. <laughs> uh, so going back to the C code, uh, in this line, uh, we can see that we're looping through 24 times. In each iteration, we're receiving one bit. So we can assume that the word length we're being sent is 24 bits long. Now, if we look inside the for loop, uh, we're getting one bit in. Uh, so we achieve this by first pulsing the clock on, reading a bit in, and then pulsing the clock off. Uh, and then also, when we read the bit in, we shift the previous bits over so that we build our 20-bit, our 24-bit word, one bit at a time. Now, once we have all of our 24 bits 
we run into this line. Oof. So this is to get the two's complement of the number because the number that the HX711 sends us is actually a two's complement version of that number. So two's complement enables us to represent negative numbers in binary. Uh, the first bit is called the most significant bit. If it's a zero, then we have a positive value. If it's a one, then our value is actually a negative number. And then we basically flip all the bits. So that's what this line is doing. And then we've got some Swift code for basically the Swift version of the C code we saw earlier. Don't worry, I'll post code later. <laughs> you don't have to go through all of it now. Okay, uh, so with all the components in place, this is a good point to do some testing and make sure that everything is working as expected. Now that we have readings, we can have it tell us which coin has been deposited based on the weight of the coin. With the coin value calculated, we can update the savings account balance. But going back to the beginning, we wanted to make sure that the deposit can only be made when a user is authenticated. Both iOS and Raspberry Pi have Bluetooth LE. And Bluetooth LE has the concept of centrals and peripherals. Centrals scan for peripherals and consume data that they provide. They act as clients. Now, peripherals provide data and advertise their presence to, to centrals. They act as servers. A Bluetooth LE device can act as both a central and a peripheral. In our project, the iOS device is the central and the Pi is the peripheral sharing data from the various sensors and components. Now peripherals use a standardized set of general attribute or GAT profiles to identify their purpose and the data they provide. These profiles are common to all Bluetooth LE devices on any platform. One GAT profile defines one service and multiple services can be advertised by one peripheral. A central can read or write a value on a peripheral and be notified by the peripheral of changes to a value. A communication with Bluetooth LE on iOS, macOS, watchOS, tvOS, all use the core Bluetooth API. So doing it on the Raspberry Pi, you can use some open source alternatives. Uh, there's a GAP project which is dependent on Bluetooth Linux and all of it's uh, dependent on pure Swift. So to be able to get this in our code on the Raspberry Pi, uh, we need to add two more dependencies in. So we've got the Bluetooth Linux and GAP. And I'm, this isn't a, an extensive talk on Bluetooth, so <laughs> we're just gonna do an overview. Uh, so this is our code for the iOS app where we're using core Bluetooth. Uh, we set up a central, which uses a delegate pattern for both itself and any peripherals it discovers and connects to. And then we've got code for getting Bluetooth going on the Raspberry Pi. Uh, we start by instantiating a controller and peripheral, then we configure our services, and finally we start the peripheral so we can be begin advertising our peripheral services to centrals. So. Let's wrap this session up by taking a look at what we've built. So this is an overview, <laughs> maybe looks slightly intimidating, uh, but it's an overview of the final product that we've built. We've added a couple of sensors, we've also used a relay where we switch between power being on and off. We've worked with digital signal, we've worked with two different types of data coming from analog to digital converters. We even did some bit banging. Then we tied it all together with some Bluetooth communication. So it's a very exciting time to be working in Swift and hardware. It's still a relatively new and unexplored area. There's lots of room for improvement in tooling and libraries. So thank you very much for your time today. Please get in touch if you have any questions, and I wish you good luck on your career at First Local Cat Savings Bank. Thank you.